call this meeting to order. The first thing is to review and approve the agenda. I'm going to assume that we have no um, amendments to made. I do have a statement that I want to make, but I'm going to make it during general business and appearances. Uh, so I'm going to hold off on that for right now. Any changes to the agenda? Not for me. Okay. All right. So without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so general business and appearances, uh, I'm going to take a little bit of privilege here and go first uh, because I am certain that uh, many of you are as distracted as and horrified uh, as I am uh, by the events of the afternoon, uh, watching terrorists illegally break into the Capitol building is nauseatingly despicable. It's uh, just horrifying to witness a literal attack on democracy. And as a republic, we elected officials only get to govern because of the will of the people. And for a few to seek to undermine that will of the people is inherently anti-democratic. Uh, as all of this has been fomented by President Trump, I want to echo the statement from Phil Scott uh, in which he said President Trump should resign or be removed from office. Uh, in light of everything that's happened this afternoon and knowing that we were going into this meeting, I just want to come that actually it makes it feel like going into this meeting is just a little more sacred uh, than it normally does because we are going into this meeting having been elected uh, by the people of Montpelier. Uh, and just like Congress will, uh, the business of government uh, will go on and we are a part of that. So, um, having said that, um, anyone else like to make uh, a statement, address the council on any item otherwise not on our agenda? Um, uh, Lauren. No. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll go Lauren and then uh, Stephen. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I just also wanted to send my thoughts to everyone in our nation's capital right now the Congress, the staff, law enforcement, the journalists that are braving uh, being there so they can show the story to us all. Um, at least one person has died. It continues to be actively stoked by our president. It's a stain on our democracy. I also can't help thinking about how this would all be playing out if this was a group of people of color. And it would certainly be being handled differently, I would guess. Um, and I'm just also like you said, I'm deeply grateful to be here with you all this evening where we can debate and disagree even passionately, but still listen and hear each other out and respect each other. And you know, no matter what each and every person in our community thinks or feels and has passions about an issue, I'm just so grateful that we you know, are here and wanna hear each other out and do our best to, to govern together. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephen, go ahead. Yeah. Um... Uh, I would just caution about the use of terrorism. Vandalism and broken windows and disruption is different than terrorism, but that's a caution for another day. I want to call to your attention and raise the issue of the preemptive uh, ultra vires with beyond authority uh, commitment. Uh, I don't know with whose approval, possibly Bill Frazier's, possibly Mayor. Uh, for the police to have entered into a per lease purchase agreement for hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment premature and before the CVPSA needs assessment is completed and before a decision is made on whether we uh, are going to have a different plan. But to preemptively uh, false falsely assert that the equipment is obsolete and hanging by a thread, the sky is falling. Many police departments continue to use the MCC 5500 consoles that the power supplies are known to fail, but they're easily replaceable with standard PC computers of power supplies. Um, there's a three console system available on eBay right now. And another nine console place is a uh, console setup is being preserved by a dispatch facility as a backup site. So for our, officials 
uh, to have preemptively entered into a lease purchase, presuming a budget that has not yet been approved by the city council or voted on by the public is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. Um, it should be a fireable offense. Um, I would, I have sought and I granted, uh, the city manager an extension so that he could go on vacation on the condition that I get the records in time for tonight, the city council meeting. I did not get them in time. Uh, I'm told I can have them in time for the budget meeting, but I sense that there's going to be a sophisticated justification for this based on a three page unsigned, undated, uh, assessment of the technology we're using, uh, which claims that the sky is falling and it's absolute bogus. Um, so I have confirmed, I've talked to Motorola dealers that the equipment is discontinued as by Motorola, but it is not obsolete. It's in service, in function in many places. It's still listed on dealer websites and it is supported. So you are being lied to by our city employees and, uh, giving him the benefit of the doubt. I believe our chief was misled in order to, uh, pursue this. So I, I would like y'all to, uh, take action and, uh, see, because if, if CVPSA does come back with a needs assessment, if more towns join, we create a regional site and a failover site, uh, we won't want to be have our Montpelier taxpayers committed to hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment that was purchased without authority. So I'm, I'm a bit outraged if you might have heard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, address one of the things you said there, which is to say that I um, have not approved of anything uh, that you're describing uh, myself, nor would I have the authority to do that. Um, so that's reassuring. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And Bill, do you want to address if you if you don't want to, that's OK. But no, I'm happy to because I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Um, we haven't but we have money in the budget um for consoles and obviously depending on what plan is we can alter our plans but we have not bought or leased anything that i'm aware of and i just confirmed with the chief um we're, we're trying to get quotes but we have a budget item but we have not committed to anything so i don't know it, it was announced that at a meeting with the consultants that the consoles were being installed several weeks ago I don't know anything. So anyway, but there's some investigation needed here by uh, preferably the, C the CVPSA delegates who have the technical knowledge to dig into it. Yeah, and to be clear, CVPSA has no operating authority over the Montpelier Police Department if they were to decide. To I'm referring to Donna and Dan Richardson. Sir, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, may I make a, a statement? My camera's not working right now. Oh, yes, absolutely. Go right ahead. The only consoles I'm aware of that were installed within the PD were phone systems. Okay. That's helpful. And there and it's again it's an operational issue. It's nothing related to the CVPSA. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, anyone else uh, want to make a statement? Free to raise your hand or um, put a thumbs up or Physically wave. Mayor, I'm not seeing anyone. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to appointments to the uh, Conservation Fund Advisory Committee, uh, which uh, for which we have two applicants. And I do not see either of them present here. Um, so I don't think there's any introductions. That's actually, I just to check, just double check, um, wondering if um, either of the applicants for this committee are here. Okay. Um, now it was not totally clear to me how many seats are available. I, um, Bill, do you have a sense of, oh, it's two, okay. Um, all right, so, uh, there's also an appointment to be made to the Public Art Commission. We have 
I believe one person who applied and there are um, three vacant seats for that, uh, for the Public Art Commission. Um, but I don't see um, Monica here either, just to check. Monica, is, is Monica here? Okay. Um, all right, is there a motion? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Madam Mayor, I usually would at this point make a motion to go into executive session since we, I think we discussed the uh, conservation fund uh, applicants at a previous meeting and since we, because there, there was that confusion about mm -hmm. what they're applying for, but uh, I move that without going into executive session, we uh, make the appoint the two members to the Conservation Fund Advisory Committee and the applicant to the Public uh, Art Commission. I'll second that. Okay. Right, there's a motion and a second. Um, uh, just to be clear, uh, I don't know if John, I don't see John Odom on. I wonder if we need to have their names in the motion. Probably not. I don't think we do. I, 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 I think we could probably am, amend the motion or just simply say that it's Wayne Fawbush and Richard the tower uh, and uh, for the Conservation Commission and Monica D. Giovanni for the Public Art okay. Commission. That's my Great. understanding of the second. Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, there's been a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Hi. And opposed. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paige. Uh, please pass along our, our thanks to them as well. Um, grateful for their for their work. Um, all right. Uh, so on to the consent agenda. Um, is there, a mo if you have comments, we'll do it after the, if there's a motion. Is there a motion on the consent agenda? Unless somebody would like to pull anything. I'll, I'll make a motion to accept the, the consent agenda as uh, warned. Second. And we got a motion to second. Um, comments? Uh, Donna. Yes, I really don't want it to go by without recognizing how successful the homeless task force was and Good Samaritan Haven by responding that I just want to acknowledge their work and, and Cameron who worked on this, that in reading it, it looks like a really good proposal and I'm looking forward to seeing its success. And likewise, net zero, uh, the whole RFP is just awesome. And, and get really excited about that. And the third thing, I and mean, this is a really dense consent agenda, was yes. uh, removing the right on red for Taylor Street Memorial. That'll be so helpful to transit. So it, a lot of good work here. Thanks, everybody. I agree. Thank you. Wonderful, yeah, I agree. Uh, any further comments? Can members of the public say anything right now, or? Now is uh, great, if you yeah. like, no, then go I, right ahead. Hi, everybody. Rick DeAngelis, Good Samaritan Haven. I, I wish I had said this earlier, but um, going along with the RFP, the good news is we successfully operated a shelter at the Christ Church, for, and we're able to house 15 people in other locations. And uh, we had um, it. We had no one that needed it uh, by the week of Christmas, and um, so I just I think that's extraordinary. And uh, talk about uh, elected officials and um, and uh, city the city government working well with with us. It, it was just fantastic. And um, so thank you everybody uh, on that score. And also, thank you for your support with the um, Street Worker uh, RFP uh, uh, grant. Super. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you do. It's remarkable that um, the shelter was effectively like not needed by, did you say by, by Christmas or? 
Uh, we actually closed on uh, Christmas Eve because uh, we had been uh, empty for several nights. And it was, it was our goal right along to get people into other settings, uh, whether that be our shelter in Barry or we have uh, something in Montpelier or a motel room. So um, we were able to achieve that. And um, that's a lot better. I mean, folks were having to leave every morning at eight o'clock in the morning and uh, be outside all day long. So it was better for them and it was better for the city of Montpelier. Uh, um, so altogether, I, I quite pleased with the outcome. Yeah, I agree. Jack, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> seeing Rick here reminded me that I should mention over over the uh, New Year's Eve holiday or New Year's holiday, I uh, <clears throat> had uh, I was contacted by someone who was uh, on behalf of a relative who was without housing, who had serious disabilities. And she didn't even know where he was, if he was out on the streets in Barry somewhere. And so over the period of several hours, I was communicating with this woman and with the uh, with uh, people from, uh, with Rick and also with Ken Russell and uh, other agencies. And uh, by doing going through a lot of effort to find this guy and make sure uh, <clears throat> his needs were met. These agencies got together and were able to uh, make sure this person was uh, was not out on the street overnight when uh, when he was in danger of being met. So so good work, Rick, and uh, everyone else who wasn't who isn't here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to say something? There we go. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you guys a quick update on my ride. Um, uh, so it launched on Monday and um, the um, every day we are um, working with the programmers to fix whatever glitches are there. Um, I've ridden it a couple of, well, first of all, let's start out with Anne started on Monday morning uh, with her photo op uh, going to the high school at 715 um, and uh, I don't know who among you have taken my ride, but I've uh, ridden it um, three or four, well, four times now. Um, I found it really easy to, um, I've been using the app myself. Um, one of my coworkers, Laura, uh, has been using the call center just to test it out. We've done some different things. The first day, it was almost like a taxi service where mostly people were going along single, one-on-one, uh, on one. but now the shared factor is working. And so um, I heard from Dan Courier from B-Trans that there were three people on his ride. Laura came back uh, from Berlin Mall today with four people on her ride. Uh, so it's actually kind of picking up. There's been a concern about accessibility. And, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time uh, out listening uh, in the community at um, Montpelier Housing Authority locations, Econo Lodge and um, Hilltop. And one of the things that we realized that would be a great accommodation would be what are called transit phones, which have been around for, you know, decades. And um, so we've written a proposal uh, that GMT now has and is reviewing to put in transit phones uh, at some Montpelier Housing Authority locations, at the Transit Center, at Montpelier and Berlin Shaw's, at CVMC, and at the Berlin Mall. So that someone could go up to that phone, just pick it up, and automatically get the call center. So that cuts out a lot of the issues about people who may have um, challenges using the app or don't want to have a phone. Uh, so I just thought I'd let you know that that accommodation is in the works now. Great. Any questions about my ride? Yeah, Connor. I just want to say I uh, took my ride on Monday there, uh, just down to the post office. It probably came within like a minute or two of when I requested it. It was fantastic. Uh, the driver, Nick, I had a great chat with. Yeah. Um, and it was really good to see the driver. Um, he was really bought into the idea. And it yeah. actually improved his quality of life, too, because, you know, rather than just riding all day, um, you know, he was stationary. He was able to take a few more breaks. Um, so it's really phenomenal. And when I got down to the post office, you couldn't see a parking spot in sight. So, you know, right right there, mission accomplished. 
Um, and I know there'll be a few bumps in the road, but you guys are doing a great job, Elizabeth. So just well, I'm not looking for praise. I'm looking actually for public comment. Right now, I, I'm one of my friends went to um, Marlboro uh, and got a sustainable MBA, and their motto was make a lot of mistakes, but make them early and learn from them. So if there's anything you hear, if there are any problems you hear of, please reach out and tell us because I'm in touch with Jamie all the time. They're meeting with Bia every morning. They're fixing everything as soon as we hear about it. And I have to say, I've been so impressed with our residents because um, people sometimes call and they're kind of aggravated. And I go, great, thank you for, for doing this. You're part of the process. And then at the end, they're like, well, I'll, I'll keep you informed. I think it's exciting that we can make this better. And so people are really buying in and having ownership. So it's, that's uh, a wonderful experience. There are some people who are still very reticent who are thinking about going to the attorney general's office, but you know, let them go. We're, we're doing the accommodations that need to happen. So over time, we're building trust and that's also um, an exciting process. So. Thank you, Elizabeth. And just so you're aware, I'm counting all of this as a part of general business and appearances, even though we are currently in a discussion about uh, the consent agenda. So, but oh, thank you. I thought we were doing public comment. Well, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, it was public comment on the consent agenda. But oh, I, I just, okay. just ignore me. I just, I'm just, sorry. It's, it's good. It's good <laughs> to hear about how it's going. Thank you. So, no worries. All right, any, any further um, comments about the consent agenda? Okay, there's been a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Um, thank you again. I know there's uh, that consent agenda represents a lot of work and I'm really grateful for everyone who contributed to that and and the work that's going to come out as a result of this consent agenda. So um, thank you in advance uh, for that as well. Um, okay. So that is that leads us to really the, the main focus of this meeting, which is the budget workshop. Um, so as I understand it, Bill, you have no new presentation necessarily to make. Um, no, um, unless there are specific questions that people have. I mean, this is your chance to pick up where we left off. Um, we can always pull up that worksheet if necessary. Um, but I know we do have, uh, I, I assume that's why Tim's here. Yep. <laughs> MDC. Uh, I should have asked them first. <laughs> so I know we had asked for them to, to be present and, you know, and then after that, we've got department heads here to answer any questions you may have. The normal process at this point would be for you to make whatever adjustments you want to make and then the council would adopt a preliminary budget tonight. And then um, that's the budget we would take to the public hearings the next two weeks and then you adopt a final budget after the second public hearing. And that's and it could be the same as this or not um and then that's what goes on the ballot yep so just to um clarify um not i mean i think you said it well bill um but just to reiterate i guess um uh, the goal is that by the end of this uh time we as a council will come out with a vote on on the um, a preliminary budget um uh, Jack, uh, go ahead. And then, uh, Tim, I assume that you would like to address the council regarding the MDC. If you don't want to, that's okay too. But um, uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor um, after that, if that's, if that's okay. Actually, uh, I, Bill Kaplan was going to be on to do a presentation, or at least uh, oh, okay. a few words for the group. So, okay. Maybe yeah, I'll um, maybe I'm, can here. It down. I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm good. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm going to let Jack go first, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Okay, great. Okay. The only thing I was going to say was that uh, for the, for the uh, our friends and neighbors out in television land, it might be good for uh, Bill to uh, put the uh, work uh, worksheet up and uh, so that people can see what we're talking about. Uh, yeah. And, sh and so share a screen and do, do that. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. 
So Cameron, if you could just let me share the screen, that'd be great. Should be able to. Okay, thanks. Oh, still says it's disabled. Well, before you go sharing the screen right now, let's um, let's hear from Bill Kaplan um, from the MDC. Hello. Hello. Uh, it's working. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, thank you for taking the time and thank you for your work on all of this um, during this difficult time. And, and additionally, I think that, you know, listening to the, um, the meeting this morning, I mean, and this earlier today, when you started, um, uh, you know, it, it does take on a whole different meaning when, um, when you see this in action and, and functioning at a high level and, and with the support of voters and the concern of voters in mind. So thank you all. Um, let's see, I'm not sure what's on right now. Um, I could stop that, sharing. Okay. Okay. I, I, that's, it's all right if it's up. It's just, it was, uh, that's right. Um, so I, I want, I think we sent a, an update, um, but I, I have a little presentation. I had a deck, uh, um, and I'm, you know, judging by how my day is going afternoon, I, I'm not confident that I'm going to be able to flip through that and, and be coherent. So I'll just speak. If we have some questions, I have graphics that can support things, or we can refer back to the report that we submitted. Um, but I think it's important to start with, um, you know, the vision and mission that, that MDC came up with after its formation in, in 2015 at the request of um, the city council. And, um, you know, the vision for MDC is that Montpelier um, is a viable and dynamic place to live, work, and do business. But I think the mission is what really gets to the heart of some of why MDC is... Um, such a unique economic development organization in the sense that it, it says to support economic activity in a way that is in line with the community values, retain and cultivate the jobs uh, for this area, support housing and business development, and promote Montpelier as a great place to live and work. And I think that that's a, that's a if you look at that in its entirety and you had to sum it up in a word, it's, it's about balance. And, and, and keeping um, a dynamic community in balance. And, and um, what we have, if you go to the board, the board is a, a committed group of over, oversubscribed people who really care and understand, um, you know, their role is not to just promote something at all costs, but it's to consider it in the context of what the city council's trying to do, what people have done in the past, and, and what people are looking for in the future. So, you know, I, I could go through everybody on there. I don't know if you're familiar with the folks on the council, uh, I mean, on the, on the, on the board, um, but we have, we have you know, a bunch of, we have a, a group who come out of our community who are thought leaders in um, community support and development. And it's not just community economic development, it's about how to support the community. Um, and we have kind of, I, I think um, it's, it's, a, it's a board that has, has functioned at a high level and, and any, any um, town or municipality or city will be really lucky to have this group. And, uh, you know, um, I, I'd love to answer questions about that if people have them, because we have, you know, we have business owners, we have people who grew up in Montpelier, we have people who are um, from the, um, the banking world and, and from um, who have served on boards and served on the city council. So we, we really have a wide array. It, it adds to our conversations and, and the perspective that we have. Um, we now operate without any staff, um, which really kind of has a working board. Um, but what it does is it allows us to 
be nimble and to be much more efficient. I think everyone on the board um, struggled with the idea that we had a full-time person and the, 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 the rhythms and, and timeframes of economic development are oftentimes not as steady as a full-time employment may be. So we moved to a project manager base. It's worked really well. And um, it smoothed out a lot of the issues that we had at, at the onset um, when we tried to kind of have a more traditional um, structure. Um, I don't think, I, I think everybody knows that it was started uh, in 2015. It, it had a, a five-year commitment from, uh, from the city council at that time for $100,000 a year. Uh, I think that... Um, we are in our fourth year this year. We were rolled back um, from 100 to, to 75. The city committed to 75,000 this year. Um, we, you know, I, I'll go over in, in, in some detail um, what we did this year. Um, but I think that more importantly, what we'll be asking for tonight and the purpose of this presentation is to garner a commitment from city council, um, not necessarily to fund us this in this in this budget, um, but to commit to fund. Uh, I think now more than ever, uh, economic development is is needed. I think forethought and and careful planning um, may turn what has been a crisis into into an opportunity, you know, and, and I do think that we have a plan and a, and a, a way to, to do that. Um, but it, it isn't going to happen in the next eight months and it isn't going to happen uh, in the next year. It, it'll, it'll be, it, it requires a, a commitment from the city of, in the same nature that the original um, consultant said, if you're going to do this, you need to commit to five years and, and let it, um, work out because economic development is is about planting seeds and trees take a long time to grow and so that's what this presentation will ask at the end is for you to do that we have um, through um, I think really prudent uh, and nimble fiscal management uh, created a, a reserve we can self fund for a year if we know that at the end of that we will be, you know, it will be replenished and supported by the city council. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to go forward without that commitment um, because to start something that is a long term program of recruitment and uh, bringing Montpelier to light and view uh, around. Um, areas that are already coming to Montpelier um, would would leave that program and the and the and the credibility of Montpelier in the eyes of outsiders at, at risk. In the sense that if if we start this program of promoting and saying, "Here's who we are. Here's what we do," and then eleven months from now, someone you know put this in their Rolodex when their lease came up in. In, in City X that I'm going to look into Montpelier as a place to, to move our business. And they call and they say, oh, you know what, um, MDC isn't there anymore. I, 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 that isn't something that our board really wants to uh, start without the ability to follow through. Uh, so I've hinted at, at what we'd like to do. Um, but first, I want to tell you what we did this year. Um, with the seventy-five, um, with the seventy-five thousand dollar commitment, we spent a, a little less than um, thirty-four thousand um, dollars. What was it? Thirty-six. I, I'm, I'm on the wrong screen, uh, but uh, somewhere less than thirty-seven thousand dollars. We spent, um, and we uh, direct benefited to the community in the form of checks, actual cash delivery of over 200,000 to more than 50 businesses uh, at the height of uh, the COVID closures. I think it was um, our third kind of attempt at getting um, support to uh, community members in there. 
we did uh, we did give a grant to Montpelier Live. We offered other grants to other organizations to uh, fund kind of instant um, action relief. When that didn't happen, our board actually sprung into action, and within three days, we raised over two hundred thousand dollars. And within thirty days, we had that that in the form of checks. Um, we had formed partnerships with Montpelier Live uh, and the Montpelier Foundation and had those checks in the hands of businesses. You know, that's what this group can do. That's what we can do in an emergency. We're not set up for emergencies. We're set up for long-term planning and, and, um, and big economic impact. But I just think you have this group of people who are committed. Um, and so we ask for city council's commitment um, to, to go forward. So what I'd like to, I think, skip ahead in, and talk about um, is a program that is born out of, uh, you know, a, a few case studies that we have, have been a part of uh, since our inception. I think we look at Caledonia Spirits, we look at Rabble Rouser, and we look at Greenbacker. Um, uh, all three of those um, groups, uh, organizations were not in Montpelier. Um, and then we supported the city, we supported these organizations in, and their efforts and, and got them to relocate from Hardwick, um, Middlesex, and um, Portland, Portland, Maine. Uh, together, just those three have contributed more than 100 good paying jobs into, into Montpelier. You know, there are countless others where we have had um, interventions and, 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 and con contributions that continue to tr contribute. We support um, a lot of the city's activities on uh, potential development, um, be it, um, you know, um, Sabin's pasture or, or other areas that come up from the parking garage to um, the hotel and, and other areas. I, I, I think, um, I probably stop there since I'm way off script and just scrolling through to see if I've missed anything. Oh, so our spend was actually not 37, it was $31,000. Um, and we have, so we started, we had the city commitment of 75,000 this year. Uh, we spent a total of $31,645 and two cents. And we established a project reserve of $50,000, um, $708.56, which um, we've uh, invested in a um, interest-bearing instrument at, at Northfield Savings Bank. So with that, all of that, we also brought $200,000, more than $200,000 of direct relief uh, in that initial 30 day period. So, you know, I've given a few examples. I've um, talked a, a little bit about what our plans are. Our plan for the, to, to turn crisis into opportunity is to target areas where people are already coming from. Uh, we've, we've seen people moving to uh, Montpelier from Oregon, Brooklyn, um, some from, um, other places and we think that we can target those areas and bring in businesses and if you look at the rewards that we've gotten out of the three businesses that we mentioned of over a hundred jobs with just three you know that all started with with three conversations um you know i i think that this is this is well spent money by the city and this year we prove our, our fiscal um, nimble and nimbleness and prudence by being able to kind of skate for a year while we wait for things to settle out. And we ask only for the long-term commitment to, re, you know, for the city council to re-up its commitment. I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so thoughts or comments? So, um, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead, Connor. 
for it. And I'll apologize. I don't think I got over email the report. Um, do you know what data was sent? I, I just haven't seen it. I think it, I think it was sent on the 4th. Okay. I, I might have it did it not come in? I don't know. Bill would know. It, it would have come from um, Catherine. Um, I also did not receive it. I, I, I'll I check right now. I don't remember seeing it, but I will check. Yeah. No, I didn't get anything. And I just had a quick question, Bill. Um, I don't know if there was any thought, like you like you said, you've had tremendous uh, success bringing some of the bigger businesses in. Um, just reading lately about Vermont Law School's potential move to Burlington. I didn't know if it would be worth a conversation between NBC and some of the administration over there. You know, especially with Necky moving out, especially with some open spaces. You know, up at the uh, up at the college on the hill too. Um, you know, I just feel like that might be an opportunity to at least give it a shot and a sell job in the city that we could be a good college town for them. Uh, Supreme Court, more lawyers per capita than any town in the country. Yeah. I actually right. had long conversations with their um, with their dean, uh, bef the previous dean, um, about that, and uh, there was a great deal of interest. Um, and we we have I, well we. <laughs> When I was at Vermont College of Fine Arts, uh, there were plans and, and proposals. Um, so I don't know. I would happily jump in on that. Um, I, I don't know where it's at. A lot of times when you hear about something like that in the in the news, it's it's a fait accompli, but maybe not. And um, are, are they teaming up with um, with UVM? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not informed on that. Uh, yeah, some that partnerships is. with UVM, and there's been talk about UVM devouring them. Uh, but I think where they're at right now is it's pretty preliminary discussions and they want to keep their independent status. So mm -hmm. we're custom designed for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, we, you know, that's something that NBC could certainly um, participate in. I, I'm, I'm going to, you may have heard a repeating theme. Um, we'd like a, a commitment so that like <laughs> something like that doesn't happen in a week. doesn't happen in a month. It, you know, it, it's a, it, they, um, that, um, relocation has been under consideration for at least eight years. So, you know, that's the kind of economic development that I think we're talking about. It, it's a really important piece. And, and without having long-term commitments, you know, I can make a call, but if NBC isn't here in a year, it's a, it's a, it's, it, those are, those conversations need to be able to persist over, over long periods of time because, these are kind of the slow sands of, of development happen um, and decision making. Okay. Um, other so I, I don't have any report in on January. 4th. Okay. Well, I, I apologize for that. Um, I was I I was under the understanding that it went. It will it will go out. I I have a copy of it. I I um, will make sure that that's the right copy and it will be sent out tomorrow morning. You know, it has a lot of the numbers and things I was just looking at. I, I had was flipping back and forth between that report and the, um, and the, um, and the deck that I had that I was going to do. So. Great. Other other thoughts or comments? So uh, I, I guess, oh, go ahead, Jack. Um, I was going to let you go first, but that's fine. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm with uh, Bill and Connor. I didn't see that either. I think what I think. I don't think it went out is the conclusion I've come to. Yeah, I, I think that uh, some of what you've accomplished has, has really been great. And, uh, and I think everyone on the council really appreciates how fast uh, you were able to uh, to recruit funds to uh, to help people when they were really desperate in the early months of the uh, the pandemic and I, I do really appreciate that um, one of the things that always uh, comes up in in a discussion of this kind is whether the uh, council has the ability to yeah. Um, future councils and you know it's uh, obviously we take action that 
has effects that go beyond uh, our our term in uh, in office. You know, one example we we approve uh, tax stabilization agreements that go out for years and uh, and they don't get uh, reconsidered just because there's been a change in the personnel of the council. But uh, <clears throat> but I do have to say that it, it's hard to. It at least gives me some real hesitation to say we should uh, we should do that, even as someone who, who strongly believes in the in the mission of the corporation. And so I think where I come down is that I don't think this is likely a decision that we uh, or that I would feel comfortable making tonight. Um, for one thing, it'd be good to have the report and discuss it. But but for another thing, I think that uh, I would be interested in, in seeing what the plan is for the coming coming five years. And part of that, I imagine, I was not on the council when the initial five year commitment was made, but <clears throat> part, I would be interested in what other uh, sources of funds would be available to also support the corporation and uh, supplement what uh, what the city is uh, is being asked to commit yeah well so i think there i guess there are three parts to that one is i completely understand without that report and and again i apologize for you not having that i'm it's completed. It was completed. Uh, we were supposed to have it on the fourth, and I thought that it had been sent. So that's on me. That's on the okay. board. Um, <laughs> or, or, yeah, on our on our board. Um, we'll get that to you. Um, I think that on the um, the ability of a of a council to commit future councils um, in our in our third year. Um, no, I guess in our fourth year. Um, the board did not, uh, or the, the city council did not honor the original council's commitment to $100,000 for five years. Uh, we did not make, um, we did not believe nor did we attempt to hold that board to that commitment. Um, we think that, uh, you know, we, that the city council has a lot of discretion and knows what's best. So we actually twice, two consecutive years, we've offered to give all of our funds over to uh, the city council. Um, and when the funds were cut back, we said, makes sense. This year, there's no funding. We've continued to work. Um, we've come up with a plan for a year ahead of how we might be able to self-fund um, through our prudence, all based on the fact that that first commitment was an understanding that every board member made to five years and that, uh, that, that the council, the city in general made. Uh, and whether it happens exactly as prescribed or not, we understand, but it means a lot. It, it meant a lot to the board. It meant a lot to future city councils to have that original board vote and think that this was a good idea. I think the third point is that um, many cities have this as a internal position. So with that internal position, you would fund it at whatever number for salary plus benefits, and you'd get one person unsupported in that role. Uh, you know, I don't, you know on the, but for that budget, I mean, for these same dollars, for the seventy-five thousand dollars that we got this year, um, you know, you would get. I, I think it's probably one. I don't know. Bill can talk much more uh, right. urgently about that, but it's about an, an FTE, maybe one point two FTE, something. I don't know. Um, but the idea is here: you get committed, experienced experts who work on behalf of the city and put all the funding for benefit. So you get all the plus 
it matches some of the idea behind the original mention in the interpretation that you there. Well, the city decides on how they want to deal with economic development. Um, we've discussed this as a board, we, we will comply. I, I just think that. Um, Bill, it seems like you're kind of cutting out there a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if you can still hear us. Um, Donna, is that what you were going to say? Well, that was part of, and I also wanted to say something when you get a chance next person. Okay. Um, well, well, I guess we'll wait until um, Bill is back. Uh, so I think um, I'm back. All right. Tim. Um, oh, you're back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we lost, I think, probably the last 30 seconds of whatever it was you were saying. Well, what, what was the last thing you heard at all? Say the rest verbatim, I swear. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You just stopped finished talking about the, uh, the full time equivalent. Yeah, so a full time. So instead yeah. of that, you get a you get a board of committed professionals who are who are really wed to the town's success and balance and future. And that relates back to what, how I started this presentation about you know the mission and vision this group came up with that it isn't to have enormous impact. It's to actually just do more of the same in a better, more efficient way and, and create more opportunities and a better living um, community for everyone. So that's, so that's, I think that's the rationale, you know, um, for a five-year commitment. And I don't think I could, you know, I, I don't think it, it, I don't think that the board would have that same enthusiasm if, if this council doesn't support, you know, a five Re-upping. Everybody on the board understands that these things don't happen overnight. It takes a long time, you know, to, to do that. And so it would be nice to know that the current city council understood and believed in that. And that's, I think that's what that would represent. It's not a, it's not a financial commitment this year, um, but it is a commitment that we would look to future councils to honor. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, Tim, go ahead and then Donna. Just quick thought to back up, Bill, and, just, and Jack asked the question about future funding and how it could be arranged, and, and one thing I've thought about it many times since this started, Eleanor Bacon's on our board. Um, Eleanor has experience creating development in Washington, D.C., and was on their development corp there, and so she brings a lot to our board, and um, one thing that's interesting discussing with her and, and other development corps is often when they're set up, the municipality the system up has an asset or assets that they entrust with the development corporation to, to create opportunities for the community and, and to make something happen in a place where the community wants something to happen. And if you're looking at possible future vehicles, if the city of Montpelier has assets that might be something you want to have something happen on, um, our board would be great to take over that asset, make it happen for you. And also if, if it's done properly, um, the way the assets handle it can create an income stream that can support the future of the organization. So uh, that's a model other places use. Um, and I don't know what the city has for assets you're thinking of a project on in the foreseeable future. You know, I think of the lot up on 12 Main, depending on what happens with conversations on that. If you decide that it needs to be um, at least part of it, have a viable building on it, that might be something we could help with. And if you want it to be a park, that's the rest of the conversation. But uh, you know, so I just wanted to throw that out as a thought, Jack, for maybe as you think through how to keep things going, that that's one option. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Donna, go ahead. Um, I t tend to agree with you most of the time, Jack, but I don't agree about this aspect of councils not committing future councils. We do it all the time. And I don't see making a commitment five years to the develop core any different than a capital plan or a change to the ordinance. I do think sometimes circumstances may create a change that's for future councils to do. It, it's not as written like a loan is written and that commitment is absolutely firm. But I would like to put something in the budget this year 
and then they can save it for next year because to reinstate all of it next year is I think too much. Uh, I'd rather see like 25,000 this year and 25 next because I do think of it as staff when Bill was talking about one full-time person and I was thinking 12 Main Street that Tim brought up. I was also thinking our, t our TIFs. You know, there's things out there that we have ideas for and maybe, you know, there are ways in which they can even look and help us be creative with our rec department. Maybe there's a private partner out there that could help us. Um, so I would be, I don't hesitate to say $25,000 for the next five years, <laughs> but uh, no, we're not asking for that. I, I should be clear. I know you're not, but well, I would, no, it wouldn't do it. I would rather put something okay. in there now and then add a, a little something next year than to try to put 50 next year. Um, that's all. So just so we're clear, we're asking for $500,000 over five years and none of it next year. So it would be, uh, you know, effectively $125,000 for the next four years. It's, um, I don't think that it has to come all from the city budget, but I do think that um, without staff and without funding for development or, or, or other resources that it would be there may be grants and other or other things that the city could apply for that would fund this endeavor but I, I do think that you know when we look at what we've done and and what we've spent we may have become more efficient but I also think that there are big projects um, you know that are on the horizon that would need more funding um, and so that's the I don't. I don't think that the initial amount was wrong. I don't think it needs to be increased, but um, I do think that it, it that that was about the right amount. Um, so uh, Connor, and then Dan, and then I'm going to jump in. Uh, go ahead, Connor. Not saying this is the way I, I would want to go necessarily, but would it be a preference by MDC to have a full time position under city government? and have MDC act as sort of an advisory board for that position, like you're saying some other municipalities do? Because to me, that would like sort of, in a way, guarantee- No, that MDC. isn't, I don't know if that structure, that isn't what I was suggesting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that was my understanding was one of the reasons why the MDC exists is so it could be a bit more nimble um, than a sort of uh, public entity that it would take advantage of some of the some of the efficiencies that a private nonprofit can have. Um, Bill, I want to maybe I don't want to necessarily go into the the depths of the you know how much do we commit how much are we committing our future selves or our future successors because I think. I think that's an argument that's both both sides are right on and both sides, you know, um, the fact is, is that today's today's council cannot obligate tomorrow's council in, in certain ways, which is if a new council comes in and says, we don't like this, they can change it. But but the reality is, is that, you know, uh, to do any type of multi year planning, which is the reality in, in a lot of these larger municipalities, you have to you have to commit um you know it's it's just it, it would be like a business that could not commit or a household that couldn't commit to future expenses i mean it's just it's just in in part the reality but but bill i guess what i'm curious about understanding is you know it does catherine's report have sort of an outline for these future plans that you're you're asking for this money um and 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 detail that you know when you talk about going after these um, these entities because I, I I think to and just as sorry to keep talking but I think the thing to that I'm curious about in, in asking these questions is you know how how realistic are these plans are, are these sort of moonshot projects where we're hoping to make something uh, as a big ambitious goal or are these sort of low hanging fruit type projects that, you know, we think you, you think with a great deal of confidence, you can score some easy victories. Yeah, it's a great question. Now, so um, the, 
we did not include um, our draft plan for um, that one of one program. That's only one aspect of what MDC would do. We would not shrink down and become singular in our focus. We would continue to to work with existing businesses and uh, and the city on new, on projects new and and existing. You know, there there are ongoing long term projects that we've been talking to um, to uh, the city and the state about. I think that there is, um, it is, I, I don't believe it's a moonshot. It's a, that's my opinion. It, it's based in example at the, at, at the college, um, we took and focused on several, um, areas where we were seeing some, um, some kind of hotbeds of activity for potential students. We uh, went with directed marketing. We went with social media marketing at not, um, not great expense, but high quality um, work that was very articulate and speaking to that particular um, audience. And it was, it was very effective. Um, and so, you know, that's the, that's the kind of thing that we would do. We think that we have the budget in, we have, it, you know, you've seen our, our, the dollars there. And that we have a, a sunk fund there of uh, fifty thousand dollars. I think that with that money we could get that launched. We could continue our existing operations, but we would need to know that there's, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, um, and that there's a commitment from the um, from this council or a, a hefty vote of confidence that this is what the city wants to do. Um, so that's the, I think that is, um, I think that answers your question, but I'm happy to, uh, fill in any holes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously the, the greater amount of detail for that helps us evaluate the, you know, the, the, the benefit, I mean, you know, in making the ultimate sort of decision about this, about the, the, the benefit to it, which is. You know, and I, I think part of, you know, I, I understand the purpose of the MDC's formation, um, and I certainly support it. I mean, I think for a, um, a broader view of where we're headed as a city, we need, and, you know, either the MDC or something like it um, to help us attract businesses to you know think about these different ways in which the city can continue to sort of grow and strengthen um and they've been and you point out some some examples you know such as like you know, rabble rouser and other businesses that have come into the city in part because of the work that mbc has done but um you know it's it's in part trying to figure out you know what 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 are the specifics because i think that can be a little bit of a and I use the word moonshot, but only because I think it's, you know, there are some of these type of projects that, you know, are bigger stretches. And obviously we're not gonna be like some some large municipalities wooing Amazon or something like that. No. To hear, that's, um, yeah. nor would we want to. I think that's the beauty of what Montpelier is, is that the scale and the, and the, and the function and the size and the character attracts, you know, like, minded businesses you know i if you look at if you look at um, one conversation you know and, and this is why i think you just need to get there will be i will state a few of my foundational beliefs that that and and the board's foundational beliefs that there will be organizations in the next five years moving to vermont from these locations and we do not we do not believe there are many, if any, better places for those businesses to land than Montpelier. If you say that there are going to be 30, and we take one, for example, we, we look at Greenbackers, which is based in New York City. They're a, they're a, a renewable energy fund. Uh, they, were, they had their operations center in Portland, uh, um, Maine, uh, with one conversation they were interested in Montpelier. They then moved here with uh, with one employee, really, with the plan to have three. 
they quickly uh, went to six, uh, and they now have 21. They had no investment in the state of Vermont. They are now the largest renewable energy owner and producer uh, private in the, in the state of Vermont. So, I mean, that's the power of this type of program. So yes, it's a moonshot, but to get one of those 30 businesses to come here is not an unrealistic. I, I, would, I would hope that we could do better than that. I, I think that Montpelier is a, is a situation where given enough information, the right decision makes itself and that decision is Montpelier, you know? And I, and I really think that we have, um, project managers, we have uh, board members and experience to, to really benefit. And, and I think that, you know, when we look at what that total funding is for that, um, you know, it's, it's about probably 78, I think I'm going by memory, but I think it's around $78,000 over three years that we would spend to likely get two, three businesses here. Uh, and in that money are, are um, grants that we would promote uh, and, and direct grant to those, to those businesses and other businesses. So, you know, I, I think that it's a, it's, it's a um, reasonable outlay. It, it's in line with Donna's 25,000 a year, that program. Um, that said, I don't think that MGC would be a singular, um, focused we wouldn't go down to being a program administrative board we'd we'd maintain the wide scope because other issues exist and will come up that nbc can play a role in that would benefit um, the city um thank you um so uh just so you i mean you and i have i've chatted about this a little bit yeah um but uh, just so so you know where my head is at with all of this, um, just for the purposes of of this year, uh, when we formed the MDC, uh, it came out of meals, rooms, and alcohol tax money, which was designated to go towards infrastructure and economic development, which obviously this year has been decimated, uh, and so it makes sense that okay, so the. Uh, one of the logical steps there is like, okay, we're not going to um, put money towards the MDC this year, particularly since the fund that um, it's supposed to come from is, is not there. Um, you know, when I think about uh, the, the projects moving on into the future, I mean, it feels like there's lots of exciting potential. Um, and I certainly want us to um, be able to, to do those things. Uh, I, you know, I want to see how the how the um, the uh, meals, rooms, and alcohol tax recovers, which I want to recognize is a little bit like um, you know when times are good, you put money towards it, and if times are bad, we're just we're just not going to. Um, but uh, th that so that's that's one lens that we can look at it through is how how does the um, how does that fund recover. Um, so that's, that's one question um, that's sort of out, outstanding. Um, and, you know, I, like I, I see the MDC continuing and- That's great. And with that, I, I could picture, um, I, I, would, I, would, I just wanna put out there that I would love to see us have greater collaboration, if that makes any sense, especially as, at least in the present form, we are the sole funder, um, then there's, there's, I mean, even like Connor was bringing up like, hey, here's an idea. Um, so what are the, what are the mechanisms that we have for communication about, you know, when, when we hear about projects, how are we getting that to you? Um, and likewise, how are we getting you feedback as to, you know, what's, what's working for us? Um, and so, I just want to put out there that um, that that's something that I that I'm thinking about. Um, now, all that is also to say that um, you know, in in asking for like a five year commitment, you know, and you know, Dan brought up like is are we debating like what that what the amount is right now. That uh, that feels like um, 
a separate conversation, uh, particularly from the the budget question now, um, because like it let let's say we were to vote to you know make a commitment for another five years, it it probably wouldn't be tonight. It would probably be a, another time, and particularly without um, without that report, um, you know, it'd, it'd be nice to have all all the information. Yeah. Um, so. Um, no. Well, this what we're proposing does not have budget budget impact. Yeah. So it, it isn't tied to the work you're doing right now in the sense that uh, that's it. it. It's much more about you know kind of getting programs going. We were we are. I think that the 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 zero funding was while not um, unreasonable at all. Uh, I think it's a message and we want to interpret that message and we want to understand whether it's 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 a it's a pause or it's a it's a change of course because if it's a change of course then we have you know kind of served the five years and we can wrap it up you know so those are the those are the I think it is a it is a decision point obviously not tonight and and the the only time pressure on it is that I think that there's, it, 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 I think that we kind of um, swim in a circle for a little while until the council uh, has the, the information and the, and the ability to take the time and, and make this uh, decision. But that would be that would be the request. I mean, and it's we're here because it's budget because we've been a part of the budget because this has impact on future councils and future budgets. But it's not tied to the calendar like the budget right so. well i just also want to recognize that I, I mean i think we have all we all have the same goal of wanting montpelier to thrive yeah. it's really just a question of how, what is the best way to get there and i think when we um i'll just put it out there I, I picture having this conversation again potentially sometime um soon um but to uh together with that have a robust conversation about what what are our options and what are we deciding for or what are we leaving um and that that's a yeah um it's a bigger bigger discussion um and one worth having even though we've sort of started started that um here right um so any other thoughts comments about this yeah uh, lauren go ahead yeah, can you hear me okay? My yes. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, I, I guess I I think the way I'm thinking about it, it it really builds on what you were laying out. And I mean, to me, I think you know we're going to be coming to you know through this pandemic and economic upheaval. And so I think the mission is going to be more important than ever. And I think we all agree with the mission. And I think the way I'm I'm thinking about it is that. Kind of collaboration and flexibility and transparency and like to me i think i think it's it, it's a two-way street of us you know if we're going to say we we want to commit to this over a longer term you know maybe there needs to be more clarity from us on you know what kind of um what do we need to be seeing that we feel confident that that's the kind of investment we're going to make of taxpayer dollars over the longer term I feel like I, you know, I wasn't here for the origination of it, and so it's been less clear to me, I think, of what, what the goals and what the outcomes have been, um, and, and you know, but I think like we're gonna we're gonna need to be doing this work, and so if if we can work together and get to the place where there's confidence that you know this this group of folks that are you know wonderful com you know committing all this volunteer time to try to think about this for our community and then um, the funding in it, so. You know, I would love to have the conversation of how, you know, what would we need to see that we would feel like, yeah, that's the kind of thing we would anticipate investing taxpayer dollars when we know it's up against other really important community needs as well. Um, so I guess that's just where um where my head is at. And I think you know what I tried to do with that, with that one example of this year, um, where the city committed to seventy five thousand, we spent thirty one thousand some odd dollars. Um, we put away fifty thousand dollars in a in a rainy day fund, and we have um, 
contributed in one in one effort one of our aspects not not all of them there are many others that you know we haven't kind of talked about here but the but in one um program we put two hundred thousand dollars back into the community so for 75 you end up with a fifty thousand dollar rainy day fund and two hundred thousand dollars of direct support to to downtown businesses and and i think I didn't say before, but we talked about rooms and meals tax or it was brought up. I think that the idea that this community supported those those places and and um, through Montpelier Alive, uh, their work, their great work, a lot of people's work, you know, we um, we gave the initiation and, and, and founding funding for the, the COVID navigator um, who's been supporting businesses all through this. You know, there's a lot of little things that that we don't do all of, but we initiate and and push along and fund. So, you know, it's um one of the early conversations that that this board had was, you know, do we we're in this political arena, right? We take political money, we take money, and there's going to want to be answers, and there's going to want to be, you know, what'd you get for the money? How'd you do it? And everyone on the board to a T said, we don't need the credit, you know, and I think it, it's both helps us work with other organizations, but at the same time, it leaves us a little bit in a situation here where you say, well, what do we get for our money? And, and so there's a lot of little pieces that we contribute here and there um, that, that add to that. So I, I understand the issues. I think, um, I feel comfortable that this has been a good conversation about the issues. It doesn't have to be decided now. Um, you know, I, I, I think we can, we can kind of tread water and, and wait to hear, um, you know, when would be a good time to, to finish the conversation and, and flesh out the, um, the best path for the city. You know, no one on the board is, is going to be offended or upset if this goes in house or if this goes somewhere else, you know, the, the goal is to do what's best for the city. And again, you know, that, that it came through every time that there was a question or a need we've offered the funds up again. Um, you know, so we can, we can, you know, no one's gonna, no one's gonna stop rooting for Montpelier if, if MDC goes away. So, you know, we, we fully support the process or wherever you go. Thank you. Um, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, just briefly, um, you know, I think we should recognize that we do need resources for economic development. We've talked about this for a long time and, and you know, I've obviously talked with Bill Kaplan a lot. Um, so, you know, how that's structured, um, you know, there's a lot of ways for, for the Newer folks on the council, when MDC was formed, there was an economic development strategic plan. And I think at that point, it, MDC's what, you know, mission, so to speak, was to implement that plan. And the presumption was that you know, there was a year one, year two, and that they would report to us how they, you know, sort of where they where the efforts were with regard to that plan. And for a lot of reasons, things went astray, and now you know recently, and, and you know some was staffing on their end. You know they've had they had some bad luck getting started, um, frankly, um, with some good people. Um, you know, but having funds in reserve, whether they're city funds or BC funds, uh, not only for a rainy day fund, as Bill mentioned, but you know you never know when there's an opportunity we might need. You know, ideally, perhaps MDC could put money down on a property, at least a down payment to hold, you know, hold an option or something like that it, it, as a third party. So, so I think there's a lot of things, you know, with regard to committing future councils, I think, you know, many people are right. If we just say, hey, we're going to get, you know, we're going to appropriate this much money over a period of time, that is subject to an annual budget review. If, uh, if, if a contract or, or uh, you know, we, we, you know, I see Tim, I'm not picking on Tim, but, you know, we have a lease with Tim's family. So that, that is a commitment over a period of time. Future councils have committed to that. We went through the process and we've signed a lease, and that is stronger than just an annual appropriation. Um, so, you know, maybe an idea would be to, to start some sort of agreement where we 
talk about what are the deliverables, what are the risk things, and, and obviously understanding that they can't guarantee so much on the grand list or anything like that, but you know, resources to do certain things um, and, and make clear, you know, what, you know, if the city's spending money on something, you know, is that something they could be doing or could we have access to that funds? I mean, through them, obviously. Um, you know, so maybe we could think about, you know, a smaller group of us, maybe Bill and I and Tim and the mayor, or you know, sitting down and kicking some of these ideas and maybe what the outcome of this meeting should be is that we come back with a proposal, you know, a recommendation to the council about how this might look and how, how funding might look and what that funding might be for. Um, because there, you know, there's advantages to having an in-house person. There's also advantages, as we know, to having it be a non-city entity because they can do things that the city can't do. And, um, you know, it would be a shame to lose some of that flexibility too. But if we are the funder, we need to make sure we're, we're uh, you know, we know what we're getting, even if it's just a service, not necessarily a result. So my two cents. Um, Dan, did you have something? Okay, go ahead, Dan. No, I, I, I just want to pick up on, on what Bill said, um, because I think that's the point I was sort of driving to earlier, which is, I really like the idea of having a defined, and, and whether whether it's an MOU, a memorandum of understanding, or something similar, um, I like that idea of defining, you know, what what our relationship is between the city and the MDC, and and the expectations, and I, you know, it, understanding that, you know, if we had done that at the beginning of this process, we would have had to revise it because of the the various issues that the MDC you know encountered along the way at, at the same time I think that's a really good process to go through um, because it does you know it, it does cause us to sort of check in to see what the mission is of the MDC what's it's what is it delivering and that way we don't have this sort of periodic where question of well are what are you expecting to do or even having the MDC think, you know, um, now I've got to sort of justify why, why we're doing this. I, I think it helps it helps define the mission for the board and makes makes their job easier. And then it gives the city council some degree of of, of certainty um, that you know we are making this investment for a particular purpose. Um, so I I really support Bill's uh, thinking along this, and it it mirrors the direction that I'm headed as well. Great, thank you. Um, any further comments about this, uh, about the, the MDC? Because um, this feels to me like the, um, the beginning of the conversation. Um, and uh, so we'll hope to have you back uh, sometime soon. <laughs> um, Great. Yeah. Great, so to be continued, um, any, any further comments from anyone? Thanks for the presentation, Bill and, yeah, and Tim, yes. and for your work. Sure, thank you all very much for what you're doing. Uh, and, and that report will go out tomorrow morning. Super, thank you. Okay, thanks, take care. You too. All right, um, so on to uh, the budget more generally. Um, there, so, I think the way to uh, proceed at this point is, are there any um, changes that folks would like to propose to the current uh, version of the budget? Um, yeah. uh, Connor, go ahead. Um, I, I was thinking a bit since um, we got that request from Sustainable Montpelier uh, to put them on the ballot, um, for twenty thousand dollars to um, continue the, the the can program, and you know I give it a lot of thought, and I I don't I don't think necessarily it's a good idea to honor that request and put them on the ballot. I think it opens up the floodgates a bit. Um, I think it has the potential to get a bit out of control. But I was thinking, you know, over the course of the pandemic, one of the things that I think has impressed me the most. Um, about our responsiveness to the needs of residents uh, has been the implementation of the CAN network uh, that you set up there, Mayor. Um, 
you know, I, I live right in the Wayne Shop area here. So the Wayne Shops are my neighbors. And uh, a lot of the folks just on the streets, you know, they, they don't have access to internet necessarily. Um, I was talking to a fellow, he was like, I wouldn't even touch a cell phone. Like, so having can go out there, uh, disperse flyers, um, do real sort of like grassroots organizing. Well, I consider grassroots organizing um, and setting up these different chapters with I think about 20 different local leaders. Um, to me, that was extremely effective and it's something I would not want to see um, disappear in the coming year, um, especially not until we're, we're through the pandemic. So I realize, like, you know, it kind of relates to the last conversation, too, because I also don't really want to get in the habit of just, you know, having a line item for a particular organization that asked for it. Um, so what I was thinking was, I want to see the CAN network continue, and I think that warrants $20,000 on the budget. Um, whether it's sustainable Montpelier, I would imagine they would be the ones who would continue doing it. Um, but maybe it's not a free ride. Maybe it's an RFP process where they would bid and you open it up and just as like, Dan, Bill, you guys are talking about the last one. You have a very specific set of deliverables for the next year. So that's what, that's what I was thinking. I, I told them, um, or I asked Dan Jones if he could put together a bit of a list. And I, I think he sent it out to the council uh, just of what CAN has achieved over the last year there. And uh, definitely, definitely syncs up to what, what I've seen them do. So. You know, that, that would be my proposal to put $20,000 in addition on the budget for the CAN network uh, that could be managed by an outside entity, but would be in control of the state on how we set, or for the city on how we set that up. So um, I just want to voice that I think that is um, probably a good way to go. Uh, I, I appreciate the RFP. Uh, process. It does feel like a city service. Um, and I also would like to see it continue. Um, but uh, having some kind of a, like, as Dan was saying previously, uh, having an, either an MOU or a contract um, so that there's expectations on both sides. And again, so that like feedback can be given, like this is going well, this is not, or this other part is not going well or whatever. Um, I think that's, that's really, um, important and that would uh, give us uh, space to to do that. So I just want to put that out there. That is um, something I, I'm also interested in. Um, other thoughts though? Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I, I like this proposal. Um, I mean, I, I definitely like the idea of, again, hearkening to our conversation we were just having clarity of you know what is it that is a service to the community and laying that out and being really clear with expectations um it my only question is you know is there is there a core difference between this and the things that we fund through and i'm spacing on the name through through our uh where we fund nonprofit with the community fund um you know, is that a place where, you know, should we be encouraging them to apply to that or would or allocate money this year, but for the future, um, that that would be a more appropriate way to do this? Or is this such a core function of, um, you know, we're basically asking them to do services directly for the city, that is what this RFP would be. And so that's why going this route makes more sense. Um, well, so that's a, a great question. Um, I think it does come down to just what you're saying is what is the idea of a capital area neighborhood network, a function of the city uh, of the municipality and um, I, I feel comfortable saying yes, because it actually originally was a function of the city. Um, not that long ago, uh, which kind of fell by the wayside. And uh, but I, I think it had value then, um, and I, I think it has value now. And and in part, I, I see it as relating to democracy, actually, um, in terms of um, uh, making sure that people get information that they are heard. Um, so, uh, particularly for those who you know may you know, are, are not as digitally connected, that, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, that's my answer to that. But <laughs> others have my, my others may have other, other thoughts. I saw Donna and then Jay. Go ahead. Um, 
my comment is I, I feel CAN has been able to do what they did because they're also out there in the community with microtransit and now with my ride. I mean, they're really multifaceted in the community. And otherwise, I don't think they could do what they do for $20,000. And so I'm really hesitant for this next year to make it an RFP. I feel we can build on this base and have a better assessment than maybe. Definitely, it would be helpful to have an MOU of some sort. Uh, and I just as we have it in the budget as to go in the ballot. So I would tend to put it in the budget, but I wouldn't go through the RFP process this year. And I, I, just to jump in, sorry, I, I would be okay with that just as there's some level of accountability, I think. Um, so, you know, MOU, something like that. Yeah, because on the one hand, it's really just a question of, are we set, setting aside money for it? And then the process of how, how we, go about uh, go about paying it, you know, whether it's through an RFP or we say, you know, no, it's definitely just this organization. Um, we can still, we can yet have that conversation. Um, yay, go ahead. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that, I think that um, I agree with Lauren that sort of making sure that we have clear expectations. Obviously, this would be funding a program within Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. It's one of many things that they do, but acknowledging that the CAN program is, is important, important specifically to the city, but having agreement on what, <clears throat> um, what that return on investment is and what expectations are, um, knowing that this is in a budget that, it's, it's a follow up on that. So I think the next level is knowing that this is in a budget that starts on July 1st, um, not tomorrow, um, that what does the CAN program look like in July 1st as, you know, things are changing and as we, as, um, you know, certainly around the pandemic, what is, what, if we were to invest with Mon a Sustainable Montpelier, Montpelier Coalition, and I'm all for it, I mean, I think they've proven their, their value on a project like this, um, what would they, if we did fund it, then starting on July 1st, what does that CAN program look like? And then how do we partner with them through that, through that next fiscal year to, to um, make sure we're getting most from our, from our investment? Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, particularly as, um, you know, as the vaccines roll out slow as they may be, you know, one hopes that, um, you know, their role may, may change, it may look different. Um, or, but, but so beyond the vex, beyond COVID, does capital area neighborhood still have value? Um, and, and I and think I, it does. I mean, I, yeah, I yeah. would argue that absolutely it does. It, it may look a little bit different than it does now um, and what it has over this past year, but um, uh, I, I think it definitely has value as we look at, you know, developing communities um, or community and within neighborhoods in Montpelier, absolutely. Yeah, fair enough. Other thoughts on this? Okay, uh, Donna, go ahead. So do we actually make a motion to put it into the budget before we close this hearing? I think we would. We don't necessarily have to do it right now, but um, I mean, do you prefer for us to wait the thirteenth? I mean, I'm just asking. So oh, you're, you're, gonna, no, we, you're gonna have to make a motion on a budget tonight. So you can either go as you consider each item to vote, whether to add it and then vote on the final budget, or you could just I can add it in as a draft number. But it, I suppose it would be good to get a sense if the majority wants it in as a draft number before you take a final vote. I, I guess, know. yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I guess my, my thought would be that, like, let's um, see if anyone else has other things that they want to bring to the table, and then we can, uh, uh, you know, consider them all together. Does that, does that yeah. seem reasonable? Okay. Um, uh, Jack, oh, oh, gosh, three hands. Um, I saw Jack, and then Dan, and then Lauren. Go ahead. Um, I, I think... I'm, I'm interested. I, I think that what they've done has been of, of real value to the city. Um, what I'm interested in and not really seeing is what 
the twenty thousand dollars is going to pay for? Is it for staffing? Is it for you know what what uh, materials? What exactly? And I think that that is uh, what I'm interested in. It's a good question. Um, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I. I I share that concern, which I think you know we've we've all been voicing, and it's similar to the MDC uh, proposition. The other part that I guess I wouldn't want to necessarily add it tonight, only in the sense that I I think when there's two choices we have to make with some of these additional what I would dub as worthies um, uh, is whether we want to add them to the budget or whether we want to put them sort of as separate allocations to the voters to uh, approve and in the sense of you know the argument that could be made for and i i support the work that can is doing and, and i support its addition into the into the budget um but my one concern is that i think a number of these very good programs you know that are worthy of consideration may also be something that we want to put before the voters rather than giving them sort of a single up or down on the budget as a whole. Some of these additional features, you know, it, it may be a benefit for the voters to be able to review them separately um, and, and make those judgments uh, on their own. Um, I think that's, that's a consideration that we can probably make at a, once, once we have them all consolidated together um those particular requests but i i put that out there that i i don't necessarily see every one of these being an in budget um type of allocation i would certainly support some of these being put se as separate sort of petition items just to clarify dan when you say some of these things are you are you what other things are you referring to oh i'm just i i, I i'm really only thinking of the can which is the only thing before us but it's oh, oh, it's oh. Uh, but but if we do find these "quote unquote" worthies, you know that that, that that which is to say, things that we we believe have merit, um, that have benefit to the city and the citizens. But um, you know, I think that we want to just it's it's a balancing of that consideration, which is to say, you know, these programs may be great, but if we add them all to a single Christmas tree, um, people may want that option and i know we've we've made certain statements to say you know we're trying to keep the budget as close to level as possible and and i think that's sort of splitting that halfway is to say you know we have these additional items um and, and i should say i'm not not on the i just want to simply offer this as a general idea rather than for specifically for can but under the category of the worthies um that that we may want to give the opportunity or option um to have those have the voters make that decision whether it's important enough for them to approve it separately um as opposed to simply i approve the budget because i i voted on the budget in general if that answers the yeah makes my that, point clear yep yeah. yeah. i think that answers it um i have more thoughts on that but they're still percolating um so we're gonna go lord and then jay yeah, I, I, I was just curious about, and I don't know for those who haven't had a chance to to talk with um, any of the folks bringing this idea forward um, from from the group, like, are, are people envisioning this as a long term commitment? Like, would this be the start of a, you know, asking annually for $20,000 to keep this program up and running? Are there some upfront costs that you make an investment now that we're getting some infrastructure in place? Um, you know, buying things that will last a while, or is it, is it, you know, are we committing to something longer term that we should be aware of? And I don't know if those folks who, Connor or Anne or anyone might um, have some answers to that. Um, go ahead, Connor. No, like, I, I think the way I, I see it is they're still kind of finding their footing. And uh, what can looks like, you know, post COVID might be very different than what it looks like in the next, you know, 12, uh, you know, 16 months here. Um, I, uh, you know, I didn't jump in much on the last conversation, but I really don't believe in committing another council to a future appropriation. So if I made this motion, um, it's, it's for next, it's for this coming year. Um, I don't 
you know, we might say it's um, outlived its use after COVID. I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, just having seen the work that they've done so far, um, especially seeing Laura on the ground there. But um, yeah, maybe it goes away. So I, I don't see this necessarily as committing it to a multi-year uh, funding source. Um, Jay and then Donna. Yeah, sorry, just a quick point, and this is to follow up to, to Dan's thoughts on, you know, what we like bake into the budget versus what we put on as a ballot item. I, I do think it's important to remember, and maybe this is, you know, for a, a, our next meeting or, or, a, or a conversation um, in the coming weeks, but I do think it's important that if, if we are breaking them out and asking these organizations to um, uh, ask for funding as ballot items, and we're also asking them to commit resources to support those ballot items in the community. Um, and so for a small nonprofit and, um, you know, who, who's looking for, you know, funding for like a small, for a, a project like CAN, um, if, if we put it on as, as a ballot item, then, then that, you know, there, there's a responsibility to try to get the vote out and support, you know, for the community to support and vote yes for that. Um, hopefully the, the community would see that value. But I do think it's, um, as, as we're looking and making these types of decisions, I think that seeing how the, those, those organizations would need to allocate resources to make them successful programs, I think is, is important. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the CAN item? Uh, oh, yes, Donna. Right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> and, um, I just was in reading what Dan Jones sent us as the scope of work. It's all about, as Anne said, information, information. And there's some flyers and there's some kiosks in the neighborhoods that people could gather and read information. But it's really people power that I see all their events. It's all about one year. They don't talk about or list anything that would involve money for ongoing years. It just seems very specific to events and passing on information and all the different ways that people, especially those who aren't on social media, would need. So I feel very comfortable that it's not promising anything for multi-years. I'm also not as optimistic as you all. I see next year being very difficult. Uh, financially, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so I think, you know, 2023, there might be a different need, <laughs> but I'm afraid this next year, people are gonna need it more in the same way they've been doing things. Um, that's all. Yeah, um, I'm gonna jump in here and then Jack, um, but uh, getting back to Lauren's question about like, is this long-term, I'm gonna go ahead and say that um, because I see this as a function of government, because I, I see this as promoting um, participation and um, uh, you know outreach to our to our residents, I I see this as a, a long term thing. I mean, it was a part. It was a like I said, it was a function of government previously, and I I would like to see it continue. Um, that is, of course, subject to the decisions of future councils. But, um, but I also see that as as this money is tied to the idea of neighborhood scale um, networks and outreach and um, and whether that's SMC, whether that's a Vista, you know, hired by the city, whether there's some other entity that's able to do that whatever that's fine but it's but that is a function that i that i see is is important to um municipal functioning um so yeah that's a kind of a long longish answer don't go ahead yeah no i'm just so <laughs> glad you brought that up because as far as can is concerned i'm with you 100 percent. i think eventually it'll probably come in-house but i was just thinking as far as this particular uh, designation to sustainable Montpelier as not necessarily being an ongoing promise or building up. Sure, right. 
but I'm really glad you brought up can itself. I think it was really sad that it got disbanded. Yeah. So I think it has a lot of good uses. I think social justice committee could tie into it. Amazingly. So as we work in the future to bring in communication and community involvement with social awareness. And it's actually, it's all just building off of that. I, that's one reason anyway, why I would support it being in the budget and not separate. Um, because, I, because I see it as a function rather than as like a gift to a particular organization. It's, there's a, there's a, I see the money is tied to a mission rather than, um, an org. But, you know, that's, yeah, yet to be told. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree as well. And, you know, I guess I, I analogize can a little bit to, it's almost like a communications infrastructure yeah. for the, for the city, whether it be, um, for the social and economic justice components, for some of the homelessness task force work, for um, COVID relief. I mean, I think we've we've seen again and again the the work that they can and, and are able to do. Um, and so I I certainly support it. I you know I just want to be clear that I'm I'm suggesting separate ballot items. I think really as a conceptual idea rather than for this one. And I'm only bringing it up because this is maybe the first of of one of these type of projects or type of funding um, that you know we're breaking a little bit of new ground with it or picking up where we haven't in the past and i think we do have to just be careful how we balance that out with the overall budget yeah that's fair um sorry jack yeah I, no that's okay I, thank you <laughs> i apologize okay. um i i i think there is value to this i think that uh, this ties into uh, the conversation that we had last at our last meeting of how do we manage in this uh, year of, uh, of the pandemic when the state has not suspended the uh, signature requirement for items to be placed on the ballot, how do we manage requests coming from outside organizations to be placed into the ballot. And we didn't make a firm decision last time, but one of the concepts that we talked about last time was that we might choose to only suspend the uh, signature requirement and place outside organizations on the ballot if they had previously petitioned to be on the ballot and been funded by the voters as a separate item and by and then be uh, asking for no more this year than they did in the previous year. And so that, uh, for instance, is the justification for putting home health and hospice on the ballot, which I think we uh, all uh, strongly supported. Um, that makes me think, and if we were to vary from that, I'm concerned that every other organization that does valuable work could decide, oh, well, the city council isn't requiring petitions. I'll show up next time and, uh, and put our request in to be added to the ballot too. And I'm not sure that that's a, a direction that we want to go in. Um, Granted that the fact that we did it for one organization does not strictly bind us to do it for another organization, but we potentially look bad to uh, to the community and to the uh, people coming to us asking that if we don't have a principled rationale for why we're doing it for one organization and not for another. Um, taking that together with and and there are other things that. Uh, come under the policies and relationships and community enhancement section of the worksheet that Bill has up in front of us that could come within that uh, that same uh, scope. And putting that together with uh, what I, I'm hearing from Anne and uh, some other members, uh, Donna at least, that this really seems like 
um, at least instrumental to city functions, if not a, a core city function. It makes me think that if we're going to do this, I would say that it should be within the budget rather than a, than a separate item. Um, when I came into, as I was thinking about our meeting tonight, um, what I was thinking was that I'm basically happy with where we left things at our last meeting and I didn't have an agenda to either add anything to the budget or cut anything out of the budget from what we uh, had on the uh, <clears throat> on the worksheet last time. Um, I am okay with uh, with putting in the money for uh, for can for this, but uh, if, as I say, if, if we do it, I would prefer that it be part of city budget rather than an uh, outside agency request. Fair enough. Um, thank you, uh, Bill, and then Lauren. Um, so first of all, obviously, this is your policy choice. A um, couple things to think about with regard to, to those last comments, which is, um, you know, I, I, I'd have to support or, or agree with you as far as uh, agency funding. Uh, you know, CVHH got their request in at the very beginning of the budget cycle, and there was lots of time for them to petition, even in a pandemic, between then and, and the deadline of, of January 21st, um, this request came in, you know, there isn't really, even if we wanted to, it would be very difficult for them to get 600 signatures basically in two weeks. Um, and so it, it is a different thing. Um, but there's another distinction that could be made, and I'm not trying to urge you to do this or not, but just to help you think about it, which is, you know, we have reduced a lot of funding and held our core functions of government down. We've cut our capital plan and, and many other things if we went up the list. This is something that's new and expanded. So, you know, it's one thing to say we're putting this on as funding to, if you were to choose to put it on the ballot, it's one thing to say we're putting this on as funding to an agency because they asked us to. It's another thing to say We've, we're giving you a bare bones budget and this is a new add on service that we'd like to add. And, um, you know, this is our ask, not sustainable popular coalition or anything else. This is a service we'd like to deliver with a discussion later of how we're gonna do that. So so if you wanted to do a ballot thing, you, I think you could make a differentiation as well as anything, you know, you could say other things even from the budget, you know. We think these are essential. These are things we've always funded, but we want to give them to the voters. I typically don't support that. I think that's what you all get elected for to make those decisions. But you know, there are there are a lot of people and organizations and, and even our own departments that are taking taking cuts and um, restrictions. So I, I think the other question to ask yourself, simply from a policy perspective, is you know. If there were 20,000, is this where the next 20,000 would go versus anything else on the list that we've sort of already resolved? But, you know, would we put 20,000 more in the housing trust fund or would we put 20,000 more in the capital plan or, you know, wherever? I, I, I'm not advocating for any of those, but I think that's, that's the important consideration here as we, we try to reach the end game. All right, back to you all. Um, Lauren, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple thoughts. Um, I mean, for one thing, I, I do really think that CAN and through the, um, the Sustainable Coalition has really stepped up and provided a lot of value without the city investing in it to this point, I think. Um, you know, so I, I feel really good about trying to do this investment if we can make it happen um i was pulling up the um social and economic justice advisory committee matrix that they had presented a couple weeks ago to think through you know where where would money go and all that good work that crew had done um and you know you can go through different groups of people and i i think for for that kind of lens and, and value set um 
I, I think this kind of investment does perform well. You know, of course, as, as Bill pointed out, there's lots of hard decisions in this budget, um, but I, it did, you know, you can kind of go through that matrix and, you know, how we're um, the kind of value and who, who can benefit from these kinds of community connections. Um, and I guess just lastly, I just, I mean, my head keeps getting pulled into what's happening in our nation's capital right now and just the importance of fostering community and connections and knowing your neighbors and not letting, you know, online rhetoric and other things dictate what might happen here. I think just the, the importance of that kind of investment, I think, is really underscored for me uh, in this moment. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you. Any further comments about either this potential 20,000 or can? Okay, um, moving on. Are there any other um, changes that anyone might like to uh, propose? Okay, so not seeing um, any um, Anyone else? Uh, just to check in, there's not a lot of members of the public here, but um, any members of the public want to weigh in? Just want to make sure we allow some space for that. And uh, Cameron, you're not seeing anyone? No, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, okay, so. Um, we have this one potential uh, change to the budget, um, but um, Lauren mentioned the, that tool that uh, the Social and Economic Justice um, Committee brought to us. And before we have any motions, I guess I would just love to run through those questions as a council. Um, so I'm going to just find that document and I have, it's sideways for me, so I'm gonna turn my head. So the first question, who is impacted by, um, it says this budget decision, but who is, who is impacted um, by this budget? Um, maybe this is sort of an exercise in, um, it's, it feels a little academic, but would, you know, do we wanna offer like who's, who's impacted? Who do you feel like is impacted? Feels like, everyone, I suppose. Um, moving on, um, what are potential positive impacts? Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and say that um, I'm really pleased that we included, uh, we continued to have some funding for the Housing Trust Fund. Um, I think that, that was a good uh, move. Um, I am pleased that we are still funding the um, Homelessness Task Force um, and that we, um, I, and I, I'm hopeful that we're, that we'll put money towards, um, towards the Cannes neighborhoods. Um, any other thoughts on who, who this is positive for? Are you talking about the budget as a whole or simply the Cannes addition? Yeah, I guess I'm talking about the budget as a whole. Um, unless people want to talk about different parts particularly. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Well, I just think at, adding quickly that we've kept the community fund whole, I think yeah. is um, uh, because that's very far reaching. It's not just one particular organization that's multiple that, that touch uh, our city in a, a lot of important or have impact in our city a lot of, a lot of great ways. So I, I, I think that that's a positive. Yeah, I agree. Um, any other thoughts on that? Uh, Connor, go ahead. I mean, no layoffs is not insignificant um, to have cut the budget to this degree um, and just have city employees, you know, assure that they're not going to lose their job, you know, for lack of funding, hopefully, um, barring an unforeseen uh, economic downturn. But no, I think hats off to city staff who put this budget together and uh, you know, in this difficult time, you know, people still be able to put food on the table. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, so the next question 
is um, what are the potential negative impacts? Um, and I know that can always be kind of a hard question to ask. I mean, even just with the conversation that we had a little earlier today, you know, how is how is this budget affecting um, businesses? I mean, we, we did zero out the Muppular Development Corporation um, for this year, uh, but we did keep in funding for um, Muppular Live, um, which has also been uh, instrumental in, in helping businesses along um, this during this time. But any other thoughts on who this negatively impacts? Uh, Donna, go ahead. And then oh, I would say a bit of our city staff because they're definitely asked to do the same with less and our and ultimately our infrastructure, you know, that, that people who use it, our services, our streets, um, they're they're impacted. Yeah. Great. Go ahead, Dan. No, I, Donna hit the exact points that I was gonna hit. Um, but as well, I think we have to keep in mind that this is, you know, built as a, a bridge year um, to get on the other side of what we hope is um, economic recovery post COVID. Um, and so that, you know, this does take into account, um, you know, this isn't, I think, I think this is a budget, as Bill said at the beginning, you know, it's not one that's sustainable in that if we replicate it next year, we're, we're causing some serious um, issues, but that it gets us across what's going to be, as Connor identified, a really hard year. Um, and I think this, you know, so there are, there is infrastructure, there is, you know, some limitation to this from prior year budgets, but it's, it, we know it going in and into it, and it's really one in which we're trying to make up this, this gap and it's not a, it's different than making a cut that we see as permanent, I guess. Yeah, and that, or any other thoughts on, on this particular question? Um, I think some of the comments that have been made, I think also get towards the next question, uh, which is um, what is the, the potential strategy for mitigating unintended consequences. Um, you know, it's always hard to anticipate unintended consequences, but we know that <laughs> we know that there are consequences. And, uh, you know, as Dan was just saying, um, you know, we are going to have to put things back uh, into the budget for another year if, if we expect there to be, you know, to, to not have longer term effects on city infrastructure. Um, that sort of thing. Um, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I I think the way this has been structured with, I mean, I really appreciate that it's very kind of human centered with for our staff, and you know, totally agree with Donna that it's going to be you know hard asking more of fewer people, but knowing that the goal is to restaff up um, as soon as we can. Um, but I think with the kind of the infrastructure being the place that we're holding off on, but also seeing, you know, I mean, it's hard to say what could be coming out of the Capitol uh, with what's happening at this moment. But I think, you know, everything we're hearing is that in a big infrastructure package is what, you know, we're hoping to see. And so it seems like a, a reasonable place to say, you know, let's be ready to jump on opportunities. If when that comes in, that seems like a you know, as good a bet as any when you're trying to plan with such, you know, unknowns, um, the world we're living in right now. Um, so I think that seems like a smart way to be positioned that that's where we could, you know, dump in. So to me, that is a, you know, a, a, a consequence of the budget that we know is going to be problematic. Um, but that it seems like there's there's thoughts on how we could get to the other side of it without, you know, in, in various ways. So I think the staff has been really thoughtful about that. Yeah. Um, I want to recognize this is a slightly off topic comment, but um, I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of days about the bifurcation of the economy, um, which is to say that like, you know, there are some folks 
it came up because I was listening to this podcast about um, housing, the housing market, and how how is it possible that during a pandemic, the housing market can be experiencing such an incredible boom? And that that was basically the answer was that you know there there are those who can stay home and work from home um for whom you know they're still employed and location no longer matters so they can move and then and then there is the you know people in um in situations where you know they're essential workers or they they can't work from home and they they really were on the edge before and they are you know some of them maybe even be falling off the edge you know, at, at this point, um, and so, you know, thinking about this, this budget, I mean, we, I, I appreciate that we really tried to hold down the budget numbers with, with that section of the, you know, the economy, that, that population in mind, um, want to acknowledge that there are probably people in Montpelier who are fine, who could withstand, you know, a sort of a what would be considered like a normal tax increase. Um, and, you know, and so I, I don't, I'm not proposing that we, <laughs> we go any higher, but I just want to acknowledge that I think there are just two very different portions of the population right now in in terms of what they're experiencing. And I know we have circuit breaker and um, income, income sensitivity to protect uh, those people who are, you know, in, in a, a lower income. Um, but I would be curious to see how, like sort of just like where where we're at, like how how it is, how is the pandemic affecting um, folks who would otherwise, um, you know, get the benefit of circuit breaker or income sensitivity, like is, is that percentage of our population increasing? I, I don't know. Um, so again, this is, I'm not making any proposed changes to what I, to, you know, what we're saying about the budget. Um, I just think that would be really interesting and good to know. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, Donna and then Jack. Well, there is some data. I mean, the state does have income sensitivity when it comes to property tax. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't understand clearly, there is something there for renters, but I mean, that is really a, a godsend to many, many people. And they would have the data and they could tell you how many households are already getting it just to have a clue of where people are. Yeah, that would be really, that would be really interesting. I'll see if I can get it. Yeah, I, if you do find that, it's easily accessible through the tax department website. They have an annual property tax report. In fact, it usually comes out in January for the, the prior year, so it should be out shortly, and it will tell you by city how many people received the money, what the total amount of money was paid to the city. You know, and so you can calculate what the average. It has both the rental rebate and the circuit breaker, and the. Um, the income sensitivity, so you can see how much aid comes into the community, and, how people got it. It's and uh, do they break that out by by municipality? Yes. Okay. So, Bill, have you kept track of it? Do you have a sense, like a pulse, of what percentage? It's been pretty steady, but um, you know, are you actually? I usually present those numbers in the budget presentation, uh, the public hearing. So hopefully, I'll have that. Okay. But it's, you know, it's more people than you'd think, more households than you'd think um, in the city yeah. that get it. Well, I'm certainly blessed by it, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. um, Jack and then Connor, go ahead. Yeah, what I think we're going to see is that as of now, there's no change because it's annual based on people's annual income uh, as reported on their uh, income tax returns. However, the tax returns that people are going to be uh, filing early this year, that'll be due uh, April 15th, we'll, we'll be able to see how many people in Montpelier had enough of a reduction in their income that they either qualify for income sensitivity where they didn't in previous years 
or I don't know if we'd be able to tell also if the amount of income sensitivity they qualify for went up because their income went down. And of course, there's all kinds of reasons for that, including you know people retire, um, get new jobs, but that's probably pretty steady uh, year after year. Whereas if there's a big drop or a big increase in the income sensitivity, it's a reasonable guess that at least a substantial share of that is because the economic activity in the city was worse this year than in previous years. Yeah, I'd also, you know, I, I feel like I should know this, but it'd be, it'd be interesting to see our, our like Montpelier specific um, unemployment rates, if that exists. I'm not sure if that exists, but you know, it's interesting because Jack's right that, you know, the income tax will have a hit, but really that won't show up until the 22 tax report because it'll be the taxes that get filed this spring that bases this year's sensitivity. We'll, we'll find out what people got last year, but we won't necessarily know what they're getting for this coming year. Yeah. Um, Connor, go ahead. I, I you know, just kind of going back to your sort of original question there. And, you know, something I struggle with this budget is we sort of assess the pain on members of the community based on somebody owns a, you know, $228,000 house, right? Well, like almost 40% of our residents, I believe, are renters, you know, and a very, very high percentage of that population works in the service industry in Montpelier. So, you know, if you're someone who, maybe you're not unemployed, but you're definitely underemployed lately. Um, and the rent has not gone down, you know, you're not getting evicted necessarily, uh, but the rent has stayed pretty high. So I think, you know, just as we've looked at the budget, I, that, that's something personally I've struggled with is how are we helping those people out? And I, I do have a bit of optimism, I think, um, with the new CARES Act and the new administration and everything that, you know, unemployment gets extended a little bit, but still it's really hard to assess people in the service industry, apples to apples with everybody else we're talking about here. Um, so I, I hope nobody's really fallen through the cracks in this budget on that. I'm not sure what the initial question was, Natalia. <laughs> <But> <laughs> just, just be pontificated. It's all good, yeah. Recognize I'm a little off topic, but um, cool. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts on that tool? Um, the questions: Who's the benefit? Um, you know, who's it negatively impact strategies for mitigating negative effects. Um, okay. Um, all right. So uh, at this point, um, we should probably uh, consider some, some motions. Uh, Connor, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'll move to include the $20,000 for, for Tam. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion on that particular piece? Okay. Um, uh, all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 And opposed? No. And um, uh, Jack, you voted no, is that right? That's right. Okay, so I think we just got to do a, a roll call. So um, I'm just going to call on you in the order that you appear on my screen. So it's going to be a little bit of a surprise. Um, uh, Donna. Aye. Jack. No. Connor. Aye. Dan. Aye. Lauren. Aye. And Jay. Aye. Okay, so the motion passes so that um, is a part of the overall budget for consideration. And um, so and just to check, uh, Bill, um, what we are looking at now includes uh, the 20,000. Yep, does. Um, so that puts us at 0.6% uh, increase. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Um, all right, so um, less than 1%, fair enough. Um, is there a motion regarding uh, the budget? Uh, Dan. Sure. Uh, 
Sure, I'll make a motion that we approve the fiscal year 22 budget um, as as presented and amended tonight. A second. Okay, <laughs> I got a couple seconds there. Um, so, any further discussion on um, budget as proposed and amended? Okay. Um, any? Oh, I think I just said that. Further discussion. All right. So, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So the budget passes and so this is what we'll take into the public hearing and we will still have the opportunity to amend it um, at both of those meetings um i think that right. is it and i uh actually have no other um uh okay i think that that concludes uh, our business regular business for the evening um, so I think we are on to council reports and I'm going to go in the order as if we were in the horseshoe. Um, unless of course, Donna, I always feel bad that I pick on you first. Cause that's always... all right. I get, I get, I get done with it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I always like to make three points about the central Vermont public safety authority is that it set up a committee to interview the two bidders we had, and it's going to be giving the board its report tomorrow night, uh, at 6.30 with its specialized meeting. And at that meeting, we're also going to talk about that we have an at-large open slot. Doug Hoyt's three-year at-large expires March this 2021. And Doug is interested in the city looking at appointing him to represent them on the council. It would be a two-year term versus the at-large. He was not interested in going for three-year term, but he is still interested in being on the board and would like the council to consider him for the other slot that Montpelier has. And we'll be advertising for the at-large. Okay. Um, what's the timeline? Uh, you said it was um, March? No. Uh, yeah, the term starts on March 21 as far as the appointment. The at-large needs to put their name in the same as any candidate to go in the ballot. Okay. All right. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Connor. Uh, just want to thank uh, you, Anne, and Lauren for your comments at the beginning. It's you know, I think all of us are probably looking at Twitter and different news sources as this meeting goes on. It's uh, easy to get distracted. It's it's really despicable and. Um, you know, it's uh, you're, you're sad to see like a bus of Vermonters go down without masks and hang out down there and come back um, after hanging out all day. So um, just hope everybody's safe and the best for everybody. Um, another just thought, you know, I've seen a lot of like negativity in our community, too. I think maybe it's just front porch forums. And you know, I think online stuff, you know, tone can be misinterpreted and it might take up the might, might make the worst out of all of us, you know, participating in those types of conversations. But, you know, like these are tough times. I think everybody's going through a really hard time right now. And, you know, fair enough, we ran for elected office. You know, I, I look around and everybody's got a pretty thick skin here. Uh, but some of the volunteers on our boards, they think they take a lot of time out of their lives to do this work. And, you know, some of the talking points around this, you know, just the talk about corruption and things like that. These are like real people and your neighbors and everything. So you know, I would just ask that if we could tone it down, be a little less snarly, you know, um, you know, this is a public, great public forum where people can come express their opinions. I think all of us are pretty accessible to have a bit of a chat there. Um, but let, let's try to hang together a little better than we are as a community, if anybody's listening. Um, so yeah, I just end with that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jay. Well, um, I think Connor said what was on my mind as well. Um, I would also just encourage all of us to um, be proactive in trying to find opportunities to have those communications in places other than Front Porch Forum. And, and otherwise, I know it's not so easy these days um, where we can't, you know, run into somebody necessarily at a coffee shop or a bar or, or a restaurant. Um, but the, the um, I think the more we are showing a proactive stance and, and trying to um, 
explain to people and, and, and get ahead of the conversation about what we're doing and decisions that we're making and what's going on. I think uh, it'll just better, not just serve us, um, not worried about that, but just better have a have an engaged community um, and and like Connor said, have more, I think, uh, uh, adult and, and positive conversations around around where we're headed. So, thanks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dan. Thanks. Um, I'm going to probably echo everybody else's comments because I think that's where all our heads are tonight, and and thank you know both you and Lauren for your comments at the beginning. I think they were very eloquent and and well stated. Um, you know, some of the and I ideal in conflict as a profession, um, as a lawyer. Um, but, you know, I think this has been a really trying time for a lot of people. And it has pushed a lot of us uh, to the brink of patience and civility. And it's hard. It really is hard, um, but I, you know, part of I think what can be the most frustrating is to blame or to get angry at an it. And um, it, in another hat that I, I wear, um, I'm on the board for the the Boy Scouts, and the complaint that's always there from the local troops are council because the the statewide organization is known as a council. Uh, spelled the same way as us tonight, um, but everybody always blames council. Oh, I can't believe council did this or council did that. And I had an executive director who used to say, who's council? I, I, I don't know anyone named council. It, it, it's, it's issues with things that, you know, you can make change if you can talk to people and you can have conversations and if you can build constructive ideas. Um, you know, so that if people have an issue in front porch form, a number of people certainly did um, with some of the new signage, you know, th there's the signs are there, um, but we can have constructive conversations about prospective or, um, you know, what can we do to come together as a community? And I think any type of dialogue and engagement with that, because there is no council here. You have six people and a mayor and a city manager and an entire staff that provide service either volunteer or professionally and we're here to talk with people we're here to work with everyone we're here to serve i mean this is servant leadership at its best i think we have a really great group of people that are always willing to listen um, but the worst way to engage somebody is to start yelling and blaming um, a general group or to blame something because I think that it depowers yourself and that makes you a less active player because it becomes less about you making a difference and more about a general grievance. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Jack. Thank you. Three, uh, three things, most of, at least one of which will be quick. Uh, the the question arose about the uh, unemployment rate and whether it's possible to find it by Montpelier. The Department of Labor does have a publication on uh, unemployment, and it's it's broken down by county and also by labor market area. So we're in the Barry Montpelier labor market area. I don't. I'm not aware of any finer distinction within uh, the city of Montpelier, Barry and whatnot. Um, but they do publish uh, publish that information every year. Uh, and maybe, into that. <laughs> maybe weekly or monthly uh, to uh, online. Um, two is, uh, I want to mention an event that's coming up. Um, the Vermont Center for Independent Living is uh, holding an event on uh, Martin Luther King Day, Monday, January 18th, from 4 to 5 p.m. It is uh, a film and uh, discussion about the uh, civil rights movement, Martin Luther King's legacy and disability rights. And uh, 
Of course, it's a Zoom event, but uh, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I don't know what the best way to sh share it is. I'll, I'll put it on my own Facebook page and, uh, and maybe pass it along to, uh, to the city uh, to build to. I don't know. Pub publicize it so people can know about it. Um, sure. Thanks. And, uh, and in keeping with uh, the events of the day, which are just so disheartening, and with which other people have said, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, headline in the New York Times right now, and the headline is, Mob Incited by Trump Storms Capital. And I just think, what would we think if the headline were Mob Incited by Putin, or Mob Incited by Duterte, or Mob Incited by Maduro Storms Capital? Mm. That's that's all. Mm. Thank you, um, Lauren. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick updates. I, I don't think I had mentioned this last time, but wanted to let you all know that the um, Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee has been doing fundraising to supplement the ten thousand dollar allocation, and they have so far raised um, from the Vermont Community Foundation, got a Spark grant for three thousand dollars and the Ben and Jerry's Foundation, a $2,000 grant. So we've been bringing in some, some funding um, so that we can uh, do more of the work in the, uh, with the contractor that we've hired um, that we're aiming for. So I know the, the volunteers have been working really hard um, on that piece and continue to, to do more um, fundraising. So I wanted to acknowledge that and let you all know. Um, and that process continues to move forward and there's gonna be some, I think, really um, informative uh, community conversations with various um, stakeholder groups in our community um, in the next, uh, you know, six to eight weeks or so. Um, so that should be great. Uh, I'm really, really grateful that's uh, continuing to happen. Um, and lastly, just didn't mention it earlier, but was in our very packed consent agenda, um, Donna had mentioned it, so I didn't bother, but I am really excited to see the net zero um, move forward. And uh, some really great proposals came in and the one that we've been able to move forward with, I think it's it's really exciting. And just, you know, in this moment of such, you know, upheaval, that kind of forward looking vision that we're still keeping our eye on as a community of how we rebuild, you know, in better ways, um, I think is really, critical to, you know, a more sustainable and resilient community. So I'm really excited that that is continuing and the, the opportunities in there. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess just to start, I, um, Dan, something I heard you say was that people are really stressed out now. And I, I just want to acknowledge, I, I, I want to highlight that. I, I feel like people are really, um, there's a lot of anxiety uh, in the community right now, especially today. Uh, but even before today, I think there's been a lot of uh, just latent um, stress and anxiety in, in the community. And I think that expresses itself in lots of different ways. And so in as much as we all can, I think it is more important than normal to um, just have grace for each other. Um, you know, when somebody expresses something in a way that you're like, oh, I don't really want to hear that, like to breathe through it, to see the human <laughs> that uh, that is that's stressed out and um, and that it might be um, related to any number of things and uh, yeah to to treat each other with with grace um, I think is really key especially right now um, so besides that separate topic um, I know we talked about it at the beginning with uh, the my ride the GMT but I want to come back to it again because I am super excited about it and if you have not yet downloaded the app for it I would highly encourage you to do that and try it out um, I mean it's free it is uh, you know it's it's I think it's gonna be a game changer for a lot of people in Montpelier so um, I would encourage you all to try it uh, and, and if you need a, a ride from 
anywhere within that zone. Oh, Jack's got it. Awesome. <laughs> if you need help, if you're having glitches, um, just, I mean, you can let me know. You can let um, anyone from GMT know. There's there's people to call if, if there's any issues with it. Um, so anyway, highly encourage you all to, to do that. Uh, okay, I guess that is, oh, but so, that's also to say I've taken it to work every day this week and it's been great. I'm going to take it again tomorrow. Um, taking it home from work. It's, it's been fabulous. So, all right. That's, um, that is, I, Oh, there actually I have one more thing, um, <laughs> which is that, um, this is the, the time of year when we do uh, the city manager review. And so I, <laughs> So I'm going to be um, sending out the uh, survey. <laughs> Bill turns the cameras off. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be sending you out a, a survey, um, uh, hopefully with, by the end of the week. Uh, and if you could be filling that out, that'd be great. I think we have on the agenda tentatively. Um, when is it, Bill? It's like first meeting in first February. meeting in February. Yep. To um, have an executive session about that. Um, and I did, Bill, did we determine, like, I think that is this also a year? Is. I didn't check, but I think. Okay. It. This is also um, a year, we think, to, um, in which we need to renegotiate um, Bill's salary, uh, the contract. And so just put that on your radar as well, um, that that is coming up. And uh, should that process should be completed before town meeting day. Um, Yep. So just note about that. Um, Jack, did I see you have a, had a hand? Did I imagine no. that? No. Okay. Just make sure. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Um, I think that is it for me. Um, John is John on. I don't see John Odom. So maybe he doesn't have a report. Well, sure, fair enough. It's nice bill to, to take the minutes for today, I believe. Oh, okay. Right. Just because it was fair uh, enough. Budget workshop. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, Bill, see yeah. I, so I don't have much. I, I appreciate everyone's kind words about um, being stressed. You know, I think certainly the city employees have felt that um, not only worried about the budget process, but the pandemic and the pressures on them. Um, so I think <clears throat> those. I'd like to thank you all for, you know, so far a very smooth budget process and understanding what we're trying to get. And of course, again, thank our whole team um, for the work they did in getting a good budget. And uh, looks like 2021 is off to a banging start. I guess so. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, um, with that, um, stay safe and healthy, everyone. And uh, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned. Hey. Yesterday I told Lauren we'd be done by 8.30. Here we go, 9. Pretty good. Oh, we're close. It's better than 10. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everyone. Hey, all. Night. See you.